Good morning. What a wonderful day we have today with all this partial sunlight. Thank you all for being here this morning. We have a packed agenda and we will get through it efficiently. Um, this morning's invocation is by Reverend Lisa Strauss of Buda United Methodist Church. If you will please all rise. Will you pray with me? Holy One, you are known by many names, and you exist beyond all names. We ask your blessings on the people who have been called to lead this community in which we live and work and play. Help them as leaders to ask, what do we need to learn? How might we need to change? And to whom do we need to listen? Remind everyone here today, because we all forget, we all forget from time to time, that we are not only leaders, but also servants, and that it is your resp our responsibility to serve the common good. Remind everyone here this day that no matter where we live, everyone, everyone is our neighbor. Everyone is part of our same family. And remind us that throughout the ages, prophets have called the leaders of the people to respect and protect the least of those among us, our children, the elderly, the poor, those who are hungry or have no homes, those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit, the strangers and immigrants in our midst, those who live on the margins and those who are alone. Grant everyone here today the wisdom and courage to know and do what is right and good and true. May all of us speak out when it is a time to speak out. May all of us listen patiently and receptively when it is time to listen. May all of us be guided by the spirit of community, by the spirit of justice, and most importantly, by the spirit of love. This we pray in your name, the one we hold sacred and holy. Amen. Amen. Well said. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. And will you please call the roll? Commissioner Schell? Here. Commissioner Inglesby? Here. Commissioner Smith? Here. Commissioner Jones? Here. Judge Becerra? Here. And now we move on to public comments. Those in the audience who have submitted a public participation <coughs> witness form will now have three minutes to speak on non-agenda related topics. Unfortunately, no action may be taken by the court during public comments as we are expected not to respond. Any questions will be taken as rhetorical. Please keep your comments and language civil and respectful or you will forfeit the remainder of your time. In the spirit of respect, please silence your cell phones. And we have three signed up to speak. Our first is Mr. Dan Lyon. Thank you, Judge and Commissioners. Uh, I noticed in San Marcos Daily Record yesterday that the county is joining another lawsuit. I'm also against this pipeline for running directly across some of the most beautiful hill country in Hayes County. Even more importantly, I am against it as a violation of property rights. I also believe that the pipeline is necessary because in the Permian Basin alone, Enough natural gas is flared off to supply every household in the state of Texas with electricity. There are alternatives to the current dilemma. One would be to run the pipeline south of San Antonio where many landowners would welcome the revenue. Another alternative would be to have the pipeline stop short of the hill country and terminate at a power plant to provide, produce electricity which could be fed into existing power lines. Unfortunately, this court has chosen a path of confrontation instead of cooperation. One of the commissioners has admitted that we cannot stop this pipeline, we can only delay it. 
Why the expensive lawsuit then? The answer is grandstanding. This way, when you are campaigning, you can tell your constituents that you did all you could to stop the pipeline. The court is approaching this lawsuit under the guise that you are concerned about the endangered species, <coughs> the golden-cheeked warbler among them. The only bird that I know of which has been helped by the county is the dark-suited contractor vulture, which feeds voraciously on the people's tax money and congregates on the third floor of old buildings in San Marcos, usually on Tuesday mornings. The Chinese can build two hospitals in less than 10 days. It takes years to build a jail and roads in Hayes County. Our current tax, Texas House District 45 representative could have sponsored a bill which would have given landowners more rights and property. But I guess that might have interfered with the current system of shearing the taxpayer's sheep through exorbitant taxation. All right, let's get to the disbursements. We got SI Mechanical LLC AC repairs at the government center. Nine disbursements, $8,938.33. Quarterly maintenance of the government center, SI Mechanical, $9,000. $719.39. The fence lady, damage repairs, uh, water damage repairs at the courthouse, $37,032.38. Where have we heard of the fence lady? Oh, yeah, community impact newsletter. I encourage everybody to read that article. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lyon. Let's keep that timer going. Next up, we have Ms. Kate Johnson. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Kate Johnson, Chair of the Hayes County Historical Commission. I want to let you know that we have new office hours for the Hayes County Historical Commission located in room 103 downstairs. Our office will be open every Tuesday from 9 to 4. Vanessa Westbrook will be volunteering to keep the office open. The Courthouse Museum will also be open 9 to 4 every Tuesday. In addition to our regular hours from 10 to 2 on the second and fourth Saturday of each month. We invite everyone to stop by and enjoy our exhibits in the museum. The restoration of our fountain on the east side of the Courthouse Square is now completed and will be in operation soon. We only need to complete the repair of the marble surrounding the base of the fountain. I also want to thank each of our county commissioners and the county judge for all your support and commitment to preserving the history of Hayes County. We have been able to do so much in the past years due to your help. Thanks to you, our Hayes County Historical Commission has been recognized with a multitude of distinguished service awards from the Texas Historical Commission given to Hayes County for the quality of our preservation work. The Hayes County Historical Commission has been recognized continuously every year since 2008 with this award. Many of our volunteers have received numerous awards from the Texas Historical Commission in the areas of cemetery preservation and their enormous voluntary contributions. Every chairman of our historical commission has received the prestigious John Ben Shepherd Leadership Award, including myself. The Hayes County Historical Commission thanks you for your continuing support of our efforts <coughs> to preserving the history of Hayes County, and we applaud you for your devotion in helping us. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And our final speaker is Mr. Mike Lee. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for um, let you know that I'm grateful for the opportunity to appear here and speak. Of course, I'm here to speak again about light sight and release. And I'm thankful, first of all, for Commissioner Inglesby and Commissioner Shell for educating me and informing me on this issue. But it wasn't, even though I've come here before to speak of it, it wasn't until probably last week I thought, what do I want? 
what I, what I think, what I want, and what I think is appropriate for this body to do is to denounce the racist practices of the San Marcos Police Department. I don't think that's asking too much. I think it's a darn shame that we are here in 2018 talking about a problem that was sought to be, sought to be solved in 1870. And uh, in the legal profession, among my colleagues, not my, not my prosecution colleagues, this county is known as being a racist county. And I believe that, that the results of that report can feed into that. And I don't think that's the kind of thing that we need here in Hayes County. We need to be better than that. I know we're better than that. And we will be in it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mike Lee. <coughs> will you please open agenda item number one? Number one, introduction of the magistrate judge Benjamin Moore and the indigent defense coordinator Kelly Pulpin. Oh, what a sweet day this is. Yes, sir, indeed. Good morning, commissioners, and good morning, judge. Mm -hmm. I'm Tacey Zellhart, judge of Hayes County Court at Law Number 3. It is my honor and privilege today to introduce to you our new magistrate, Judge Ben Moore, and our new indigent defense coordinator, Kelly Pulpin. Judge Moore has been a Hayes County Assistant District Attorney for 16 years, most recently serving as the Felony Division Chief. During his tenure in Hayes County, Judge Moore has built strong relationships with many county departments that will benefit him in his new position. The Board of Judges Hiring Committee appreciates Judge Moore's forward, forward thinking and his innovative ideas in regards to our criminal justice system, all while appreciating and understanding the important duty of public safety. We welcome Judge Ben Moore. <laughs> Kelly Pulpin was unanimously recommended by the Board of Judges Hiring Committee to serve as Hayes County's first indigent defense coordinator. Kelly has been a Hayes County employee for almost 14 years. She most recently served as a lead assistant court administrator in the county courts at law. Our loss is the county's gain. Kelly is a very dedicated employee with an impeccable work ethic. We are confident she will build the Indigent Defense Coordinator Office to be one that is looked on statewide for its efficiency and effectiveness. Please welcome our new Indigent Defense Coordinator, Kelly Pulpin. I want to thank the Commissioner's Court and for your leadership and us being able to develop these two new positions. Your work and your leadership uh, have meant the world to us and I think it's gonna have a huge impact on our county. So thank this court very much. Thank you. And we're not done yet. Oh, but there's so much more to do. Get used to that title, Judge. Would you mind giving us a little bit of something to say on each of you guys, if you guys will introduce yourselves personally? Come on, Kelly. My name is Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> at the podium for the world to see. <laughs> My name is Ben Moore. I've been a servant of Hayes County for 16 years. Uh, I really care about the county, the criminal justice system. I've been, a, I'm a resident. I really have a lot to offer. I'm looking forward to the opportunity that you've given me to streamline some of the processes and make the county a better place. The only thing that I can promise to do is to do the best I can where I am with what I have. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And just to recap, you're also going to hire two part-time magistrates so we could have seven-day magistration for the audience to see. Correct. Thank you, sir. And Kelly? Good morning, everybody. My name is Kelly Pulpin. I was born and raised in San Marcos. I've been a long-time Hayes County resident. I look forward to um, serving you in this new position, and I'm excited to what I can bring to the indigent defense coordinator position. Yes. Beautiful. Thank yeah, you, ma'am. Thank you Thank so you. much. And today is their first day on the job, so we're going to go get to work. Thank you all. <laughs> Just for everyone else to hear this, one last piece, uh, judge or judge, when will you and where will you be magistrating officially at its first day? Judge, I want to be there, just to tell you the truth. I want to be there on day one for you. We will let the court, we will notify all members of the court when that will be. Judge Moore will be at the government center until September when his new office is ready over at the jail complex. 
Okay. So he will be uh, magistrating from his office at the government center or over at the jail, but he will be housed or officed at the government center until his, his courtroom and his, ready. is ready in September. Judge Moore, I want to be there for you for day one. Thank you so much, and we appreciate all you guys are doing for uh, modernizing our criminal <laughs> justice system. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Will you please open agenda item number two? Two. Adopt a proclamation declaring February as Spay Neuter Awareness Month in Hayes County. <clears throat> proclamation declaring February 20th as Spay Neuter Awareness Month. Whereas domestic animals have provided companionship to people for centuries, offering love and loyalty and providing many other benefits to their owners and human families. And whereas 65% of the U.S. households own pets, but millions of animals are left homeless, living on the streets or house, housed in shelters. And whereas each year about 2.4 million animals who are otherwise healthy and adoptable are euthanized in animal shelters because of lack of resources. And whereas it is estimated that 90% of pets living in poverty and 98% of feral and stray cats are not spayed or neutered allowing them to reproduce and add to the overpopulation problem. And whereas spay and neuter initiatives reduce the number of homeless animals, certain life-threatening diseases, and even curb pets' negative behaviors, now therefore be it resolved that the Hayes County Commissioner's Court does hereby proclaim the month of February 2020 as Spay Neuter Awareness Month and does hereby call upon the people of Hayes County to help control the overpopulation of homeless animals in our community by spaying and neutering animals in their care to donate to a local animal welfare group or sponsor the spay and neuter of other pets to make a big difference in an animal's life and to help make resources go further at the local animal shelter adopted this fourth day of February 2020. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are there any other comments? Just appreciate the uh, court support and a lot of our efforts recently. Commissioner Inglesby, uh, her support as well, and been very active lately uh, working with our partners in the uh, city of San Marcos, and uh, we've done some good things, but we've got a lot, a lot further to go. That's right, Commissioner, and I am very grateful to exactly what you just said. This court has historically done a wonderful job of supporting not only with our time, energy, and attention, but also with our county resources. Uh, and I think it's a, a very big noteworthy item to say how much we've committed as a county, as a court, to this effort. And so I'm just very grateful for it. And thank you, Commissioners. Thanks, Judge. Uh, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Inglesby? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Schell? Yes. Judge Becetta? Yes. And with that, I have a tiny little gift before we do the option of the photo op for a proclamation. I have a tiny little present to unwrap for the community. Ms. Sherry Boyette, will you tell us why you're here? Good morning, court. Good morning, Hayes County. I've been speaking on behalf of the homeless animals and shelter pets for over 20 years. I was the founder of the Prevent a Litter organization, which offers spay neuter assistance. And today, I have been um, appointed as the first animal advocacy advisor and community li liaison to the county judge's office, giving my advocacy and volunteer work credibility and furthering the missions of the No Kill Initiative. Um, last October, um, no, October 2018, this court initiated a No Kill Resolution and I am very, very proud of all the work that the court has done in having the no-kill momentum move forward. I have been working behind the scenes with lots of rescue organizations and the shelter and the PAWS shelter. And there are many people who also speak on behalf of the voiceless animals. Our, um, our prayer this morning, we had um, and an appeal to the Lord about when to speak. And now is the time to further this mission, which includes the no-kill, this is very passionate for me, the no-kill momentum for everything that we've worked on for over 20 years, bringing this shelter in this county to the best practices. Um, with this appointment, I will be working to bring the county into a network, a coalition, Hayes County is working towards no-kill, and this is a community effort. It is not just that little shelter building on River Road where no one hardly ever sees 
So please volunteer, foster, donate, and we'll be reaching out to everyone who has ever cared about a dog or cat and who has ever cared about the taxpayers' dollars going to the best practices to save lives. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. And now those... Uh, Judge, one second. I, do, I wanted to ask, following up on the resolution that we passed last year, what other, and forgive me for not knowing this, but what other of the municipalities in the county, which municipalities have not adopted, a, who participate with us, have not adopted a, uh, a similar resolution? My question is, who out there has, has not chosen to participate as we have as a county? I believe they all have in some form or fashion, but not as strong as the Hayes County No Kill Initiative. Okay. Some of them are still waiting for what basically I will do, which is to try and do a unification of all of the people and parties. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, Commissioner. All those interested in the picture for this proclamation, will you please approach the podium? I mean the bench. Did we take a vote? No. Not yet. No? Not yet? Okay. I'll do it after, I guess. Whoops. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Okay. A motion was made, Judge, yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Now will you call the roll? And that was called as well. It was? Okay. Because I was yeah, told it wasn't. It's okay. <laughs> no, no, no problem. I'd rather do it twice than not at all. Okay, will you please open agenda item number three. Three, adopt a proclamation declaring February 4th, 2020 as Karen Chisholm Day in Hayes County. Commissioner, thank you so much for creating this agenda item. I am so grateful to it. Uh, Commissioner Shell, this is exactly what we deserve to hear. So will you please read the proclamation? Proclamation declaring February 4th, 2020 as Karen Chisholm Day. Whereas... Karen Chisholm's coaching career at Texas State University began as an assistant coach in 1978 before being named the head coach in 1980, and whereas under the leadership of Coach Chisholm, the Texas State Bobcat volleyball team won nine conference regular season titles, 11 conference tournament championships, and in 2018 earned the program's first NCAA tournament victory. And whereas Coach Chisholm has guided the Texas State volleyball program past 20 wins in a season 26 times and holds a 919 win, 559 loss, three tie career record as head coach, making her the third NCAA Division I coach to reach 900 wins. And whereas only the fifth coach in the program's history, Coach Chisholm garnered eight conference coach of the year honors and in the 2018 American Volleyball Coaches Association's South Central Regional Coach of the Year Award. And whereas Coach Chisholm's dedication to Texas State University as both a student athlete in softball and tennis and as a legendary coach has been recognized by the university as a Texas State Distinguished Alumni Honoree and as the first female to be accepted for membership in the T Association's Hall of Honor. And whereas throughout Coach Chisholm's career, her players have accumulated over 100 all-conference player selections and over 30 all-conference first team selections. And whereas not only have Texas State volleyball players excelled on the court, but they have excelled in the classroom and the community, having been recognized for six consecutive years by the Sun Belt Conference for achieving a team GPA of 3.0 or higher. And whereas Coach Chisholm announced her retirement from coaching this past December, leaving a legacy of Bobcat volleyball that will last forever. And whereas Coach Chisholm's former players, assistant coaches, university administrators, fans, family, and friends, all of whom had roles in the success of the Texas State volleyball program during her 40-year coaching career, 
wish to recognize her contribution to the Texas State University and her community. Now, therefore, the Hayes County Commissioner's Court does hereby proclaim February 4th, 2020 as Karen Chisholm Day. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Dr. Gallagher, I mean, Dr. Well, there you go, habits. Will you please call the roll? Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Shell? Yes. Commissioner Inglesby? Yes. One more. I want to vote. Judge Becerra? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Commissioner Shell? Thanks, Judge. Please. Uh, thanks, Judge. And Coach Chisholm's here and might ask her just to come up and say a few words if she, if she wouldn't mind to. Uh, I thought this was very appropriate knowing that we have a legendary coach in our community and have for such a long time. Um, she is a uh, Stepping down as the coach we know of as of uh, the end of this past season, but I know she's still going to be involved in all sorts of things. Uh, and she is, like I said, uh, a living legend here. And um, it's, it's pretty amazing that we have a university that is a coach that is regarded as probably the finest in the history of NCAA volleyball. So I think we ought to at least take the time to recognize that and all of her contributions over these years. So, That's Coach, right. if you have Absolutely. A few words to say. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you, Commissioner Shell. Um, judge, it's amazing. This is, I'm honored and I'm humbled um, to receive this special work, needless to say. And it's fun to look around here and see the people I've known and have known forever. You know, Texas State, I love. San Marcos, San Marvelous, as I refer to us, I love. Hayes County is amazing. So thank you very, very much. I appreciate some friends coming out today but I will be around. I'm not leaving. I have retired and enjoyed two weeks already, um, but I, I, I really appreciate it. This is nice. Th thank you very much. Thank you so much. And anyone here for the coach, will you please come up for a picture? What an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Eat up, cats. Eat up, eat up, go, cats, go. It's a great day to be a Bobcat. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Can I just say a couple of words, please? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Um, uh, Coach Chisholm. Coach. I really just wanted to thank you for the many years of service that you provided. You know, when uh, you taught me at the San Marcos High School, uh, the love and care that you had for the students was evident, and I'm sure you took that same compassion up to Texas State, and I really appreciate you for all that you have done for our community, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, and look what you've done. <laughs> <laughs> just, and I just, so, <laughs> has left the building. Thank you, Mr. Navarrete. Will you please open agenda item number four? Four, presentation from Denise Fonseca regarding Room to Hope, a plan to upgrade the victim waiting room within the district attorney's office. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Denise is here, and I think she has, uh, we have in backup her presentation, and uh, I, I met with uh, Denise, I guess, last week or the week before, and I know she spent some time with our district attorney's office, and I think she's got a really neat idea that I'm, I'm hoping that we can uh, get started on. Thank you. Well, um, good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, this is a whole lot nicer than the last time I was in a courtroom. <laughs> um, so I thank you today for your time and your consideration. Um, I plan to use about 10 minutes max to present today which Judge Boyer would tell you is very succinct for me. <laughs> um, I am working off the assumption that you've had a moment to do the pre-read. 
um, that um, Commissioner Shell has circulated. And since I really dislike talking about myself, um, I'm going to introduce myself very briefly for those in the room and out there who don't know who on earth I am. So my name is um, Denise Fonseca. Um, I am the founder of unbeaten.org. I am South African by birth, but for the past 20 years I have been a US citizen by choice. I have extensive um, cross-cultural global experience in business, working on both for-profit and non-profit initiatives um, across 48 different countries, which I think probably gives me a degree of cultural sensitivity. Um, by far the greatest thing I've ever done is being a mother. I am also the victim of seven years of brutal intimate partner abuse. In 2019, my abuser, Todd Thomas Cress, was convicted of three felonies for continuous family violence and incarcerated. Now, the Room to Hope project um, is a tribute to the incredible efforts of Hayes County Law Enforcement, the DA's office, the presiding judge, who saved my life. If it had not been for those people and their service, I would not be here today. My gratitude knows no bounds. So what is the Room to Hope project? As per my pre-read, all victims of violent crimes are destined to spend endless hours in the courthouse victim waiting rooms. When you're at your most vulnerable, you're most terrified, you're most distressed. These are cold, harsh rooms, and the room for children is truly tragic. These sad places heighten the emotional and psychological trauma of surviving the criminal justice journey. Now, the mission of Room to Hope is um, captured as the best I can. The Room to Hope mission is to help justice to triumph for victims of violent crimes by creating environments that encourage hope. So at its core, um, this nonprofit effort will strive to reinvent these rooms into more warmer and more caring environments for both adult and child victims of violent crimes. But you know, it's so much more than that. Um, at the most fundamental level, this is about decency. It's just the right thing to do. At a pragmatic level, law enforcement, the DA's prosecutors, the victim's assistant coordinators work tirelessly, and usually thanklessly, in pursuit of justice for victims of violent crimes. In a large part, their success hinges upon the fact that these victims are able to give solid, courageous, credible evidence. And it's where they wait, and where I waited for many, many, many hours to give evidence that's critical to the ability to endure, both emotionally and mentally, uh, when you get called to court. But at the most positive level, Room to Hope has the potential to be a truly uplifting and unifying initiative for Hayes County community to rally around. Its tenants are inclusion, decency, and hope. And these are universally motivating and relative, re relevant values. So that's it. That's me. The big question is the how. So um, I think it's always important what you do, but it's just as important as to how you do it. This Room to Hope project requires three things. Permission, funding, and engagement. Now, funding for the Hayes County pilot is my responsibility. My plan is to use my $3,000 restitution money um, and any other cash or in-kind donations that I must secure to fund it. Thereafter, I plan to expand this initiative to any other county in Texas or nationally that wants to embrace it. 
I would like to use the Hayes pilot, which is where it deserves to be born, um, to shape a hope, room to hope operating manual and guidelines for all future projects. So today, I am here for your permission. Um, some ideas about the important component of engaging the community in something to celebrate. Number one, I would like to um, approach the Hayes County Sheriff, Gary Cutler, to see if any of these um, officers would like to volunteer to be the muscle on the uh, moving stage weekend. I know I can pull this off in a weekend, prior to the weekend of taking out what is really shabby and broken and appropriately disposing of it and restaging, painting, whatever would take weekend would not disrupt um, business as usual. And I think it would be an incredible tribute to engage law enforcement and my personal heroes, for five of them, but I don't think I should mention their names until I get their permission, um, in this celebration of hope. If that's not an option in terms of labor, um, the victim assistance coordinators who work with the prosecutors, they're called VACs, um, I think it would be an enormous morale booster to engage them. They are totally aware that these rooms are less than what they should be. And all that holds them back is resources. I'm that. Um, so I think they could volunteer, three, four of them, to be my inside touch points and, of course, to be my cheerleaders on the weekends that we make the magic happen. And hey, you know, judges, commissioners, prosecutors, um, you're all welcome. I have a few personal favorites. Um, another idea, I suggest we approach um, Texas State School of Art and Design and stage a student competition, a design competition. I would provide the brief, you know, sensible stuff like the furniture needs to be durable. Um, send them off and come up with designs um, within a budget. And the winning student, I think, or student's team would get a plaque inside the redesigned Room to Hope saying, brought to you by, and their names. Simple. I think we need a muralist for the child's waiting room. Um, I believe I can secure a free muralist because it will be just the pride of being associated with this initiative. And I really think we can make a story out of this which will further engage the community. Because, hey, Austin, muralists. Um, we need a photographer. We need a photographer to take pictures of the people involved, the pre, during, post. Um, because I am currently involved in an enormous social media campaign with a prominent social media expert based in LA for the launch of Unbeaten in the next few weeks. And of course, Room to Hope is one of those projects. We need to showcase the amazing people that work in Hayes County and this end product. And I think we should end with a party. Um, there's so little to be happy about um, in the world. And I really think that if the party is nothing other than beer, wherever we're allowed to serve beer, I'll find the place, and hot dogs, um, and a reveal. And damn, just be happy. So um, it's obvious that, of course, media engagement is essential. There's very little point in creating this uplifting story of hope if it's a secret. Um, and of course, in order for me to go and change the next 5,000 rooms, um, it is imperative that I generate donations. To this end, I am also accepting speaking engagements. Um, two down so far. So we can make the media hungry via the student design competition, the mural journey, stories about the Hayes heroes, um, with their permission, and the reveal party. Um, and of course, give recognition to any donors who get involved in this initiative. So, in conclusion, if I had to be a victim, then at least I have to be one for a reason. Um, room to hope is my reason, and I believe that absolutely everybody needs room to hope. I thank you for your attention and will field any questions.
Commissioners, thank you very much. Well thank said. You. Really thank appreciate it. Thanks, <coughs> guys. Thanks for being here and uh, explaining that uh, to the court and to the public. And some ideas I had that maybe uh, we could ask uh, General Counsel's office to bring a license agreement back to court um, that would kind of spell out the uh, permission to do this. Obviously, let the DA's office kind of be the, the manager of that. Um, I think we could probably provide some in-kind uh, services to maintenance department and some some people to help, and I know there's plenty of people within the DA's office that will help those efforts as well, but I think just a very simple license agreement might be the next step so that Denise has uh, the permission and the, the rules and the, the, the procedures in which she can follow as she uh, finishes out what I think is going to be a really amazing project. Mm -hmm. Point, Commissioner? I, I would completely agree, and uh, one thing I would say is several of those groups that uh, individuals that you would like to engage in, the one thing that all of them have in common is membership in the Hayes County Bar Association, and I would be more than happy to help facilitate um, you with the, uh, with the president and the vice president of the Bar Association to try to get in front of them at their next meeting to discuss, because these are individuals who are part of the bar who represent those those victims on a daily basis? Their judges, uh, Judge Zellhart, who was here earlier, is the vice president of the of the bar association. And I know that they are constantly looking for public engagement and uh, and opportunities to help. Uh, they can, I view this project as something that they could do in their house as they would see it, and uh, it would be something that. I believe both the, I mean, every member of the Bar Association from the defense to prosecutors to everyone uh, should be able to get behind, and I'd be more than happy to do that. Thank you. I and am grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And Commissioner. Thank you, Judge. Um, Denise, I just want to, well, I fully support your effort, and I want to thank you uh, for sharing your story, uh, your courage, and your strength. Uh, I just so appreciate and your willingness to come in and transform this area into a more welcoming place for those victims is, is truly amazing, and thank you so much. Thank you. Judge. Thank you. Mr. Mao is here uh, as the elected official over that space. Would you like to have some closing thoughts or comments? Sure. I know that you know resources have always been tight in the county. The commissioners, I'm, I'm grateful for the support that y'all have given the DA's office over time, and making sure that our victim waiting room has been up to the level that I would like it to be is, of course, never been the highest priority because we have so many other things that we have to spend our money on that cost resources for the county. Having a project like this in place is going to, I think, make a big difference for some of our most vulnerable people that we interact with. I know this is something that all of you are concerned about. I know particularly Judge Becerra has uh, talked uh, about and has made some overtures towards doing some some muralists work in our child waiting room. This is obviously a larger project, which will, I think, have a, a bigger impact, make it a lot easier for us to, we, we do what we can to try to make the process of going through the criminal justice system as comfortable as we can for the people that are involuntarily dragged into it by being victims of crimes. This process is going to, I think, cushion that process a little bit for those folks. It's never going to be easy. It's never going to be not difficult, but it is at least they can be comfortable and in an environment that gives them the hope that I think Ms. Fonseca is hoping to give to them, which I know I can't imagine none of you are behind. So I think she's looking today to get your permission, to get your endorsement for a project like this. I think Commissioner Schell's uh, idea to have Mr. Kennedy look for some licensing type uh, agreements is a great first step forwards. And Ms. Fonseca is excited. Her excitement is, is her excitement is contagious. Uh, I get excited about it when I talk to her that something like this might actually happen for us and for the victims of crimes that we have to deal with. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to working more on this project as I know the rest of you are. Thank you, sir. Ms. Mr. Mao, I do have, I do want to say one thing. I, <clears throat> I've had some interactions with family members and those kind of things where they've had to go through processes as, as victims. And one thing as you look at this that I would really encourage, and I don't know if this was done because I wasn't here when the courthouse was built, uh, and I wasn't part of that, uh, that process, but as you look at this process, one thing that I would encourage and that I would be a huge advocate for 
is developing some process, uh, and maybe this is an internal process, you uh, in your office, uh, the interactions you have with the victims of these crimes, um, in order to not only shelter them when they're in this room, but create a process by which whenever they arrive at the courthouse and whenever they leave the courthouse, there's nothing more disheartening for a victim than on their way to that, that safe space that we're creating here. Uh, that protection, that not having that protection as they walk in, not having um, the, the knowledge that they're gonna be okay even getting to the courtroom. And those unintended interactions before they ever reach the courtroom, before they're ever there, that's where some of the most devastating mental things happen to these victims. And as you look at this, this, I don't know if there's extra entrances that you we can look at or what might be there. And I know this is very outside the box, but it's something that I would I would be very supportive of, and I'd love to work with you on if if needed. No, and I I think that's a good idea, Commissioner, and something that we would need to work together with the sheriff on. The sheriff's responsible for the security in the building, which I think is what you're referring to, is the process yeah. of going through security. There are additional entrances that are available for employees that uh, are not otherwise secured, and I think the sheriff, as, as I said, would have to be involved in making sure that even when victims are coming in, they have to be they have to be screened to some degree because everybody does. Right. But that's that's certainly something that would, I think, go some distance towards making victims feel more comfortable. The victims of crimes are going to have to get up and and relive a horrible, horrible experience to at least make the experience preceding that a little more pleasant. Thank you. Mr. Mao, will you please open agenda item number five? Five, update the Citizens Election Advisory Commission. Presentation of the Hayes County Service Awards. Mr. Salcedo, the floor is yours. Service Awards? I don't know. I don't know why they put your name on it. It was just a presentation. That was just how long it sticks. Good morning, Judge Pacetta, student court. Um, to the commissioners and to the clerk. They're three pages each. What a useful and productive podium we have. Thank you for being there. Okay, thank you, Judge. Good morning, Court. Uh, my name is Roland Salcedo, and I'm the chair for the Citizens Elections Advisory Commission. Um, I am here today to give you all an update on what we have been working on and what we are continuing to work on. Um, I do apologize that we did not come in January. However, there were scheduling conflicts with our commissioners. So we were not able to meet until the 22nd, which passed the 14th. But um, thank you to Jennifer Anderson, who came and um, listed, gave you all the list of the polling locations so that way they could be adopted in a timely manner. Um, so some of the things that we have been working on is, um, you know, the, the primary focus that we've been looking at is at the numbers of past elections and however the numbers of past elections it makes it a little bit um, redundant for us to really look at those numbers because things have changed in regards to number one we have the voting centers as you know we no longer vote by precinct um, number two um, even the precinct numbers have changed you know where we had 49 precincts previously we now have 68. 
So other things that we're looking at is population density. We have been getting input from citizens. Um, we've at all of our meetings, we have been fortunate enough to have um, quite a, a good number of citizens, a good number of citizens that come in and give us input and share some concerns and ideas that they may have. So we're taking all of that into account. Um, Robert Smith had appeared at our last meeting and has drafted a report that he's going to be sharing with our commission that of course we'll extend out to y'all that's going to provide us with some valuable information, numbers. Um, so we're really excited about, you know, moving forward. Um, we had decided that it would probably be best for us um, not to come before the court until around July um, to give our recommendation for the November elections. Um, and the reason that we chose that is because we want to take into account the primary um, election and as well as if there's a runoff election in May, we can utilize those numbers as well. Um, we do have four voting um, locations, as I'm sure Jennifer shared with you all, that um, have been removed from the primary election. And But there was, in I think, two cases, there was replacements. Um, but, however, there is quite um, a number of polling locations, voting lo center locations, that want to opt out in the November election. And so that's another challenge that we're facing as a Citizens Elections Advisory Commission, is we are, we are scouting um, other locations and um, with the help, you know, Get, trying to assist the Elections Administration Office as much as we can in the vetting process to make sure that, you know, they're usable, it's legal, you know, um, there's adequate spacing. Um, because as you know, the, vo the, the voting machines that we use now is a quite larger, it takes more space because of the two extra components as opposed to the previous machines that we used to use before. Um, the other thing, the other challenge that we're going to have is even when we give our recommendation in July or August, whether, whether that, what month that may be, we also have to look forward into the massive changes that are going to be occurring in 2021. Because remember, this is the census year, and with the census year, you know, we'll be able to get hopefully a more accurate count of our citizens. Um, as well as the registered voters, along with the fact that we're going to have to deal with the redistricting of lines for the legislative, and as well as y'all's lines are going to be redrawn, and state senate and state representatives. So those are other things that we're looking ahead towards. Um, and um, we're also looking at the growth in the ETJs um, that are outside of the municipalities. Um, with, I, with Highway 110 coming in, we anticipate that there's going to be growth in that area and development. So these are all things that we're keeping on our radar, on our radar, because we want to make sure that we can, you know, the, the delivery of services for our constituency is there. Um, you know, I don't know if any of y'all are aware, but you know, precinct 301 was created and has never had a not even one registered voter but you know we're not closing down that precinct but just to make it aware that precinct 301 has, does not have one single registered voter um other than that um there's um other than that we, like, like i said the numbers what i have provided you with this map what we're doing with this map is we had several citizens and commissioners express concerns. And on y'all's maps, I drew little yellow circles with the, with the highlighter. Those are areas indicating that um, there are no vote centers. And we have gotten um, concerns um, from the citizenry that they would like to see vote centers in those areas. 
So we are looking into the um, thoroughfares that run through there, the highly trafficked roads, because that is one of the requirements. We've been working with Jennifer in regards to what the vetting process is. And um, so um, I do apologize at this short notice of my presentation and I have to be at another event, but um, the, the other things that we're looking at is Jennifer's providing us with information from the office and I'll let her, if, she'll, if Jennifer, if you'll come up, I'll let her speak a little bit about that, about what she's helping us about. Really, Lynette, I, I do have one question for you. Yes, sir. Sit down. On the map that you gave us, one of these circles isn't even, it's not in Hayes County. Right. It's. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, like I said, this was short notice. I was just like, you know, I was trying to get yeah. all of this together this morning. I can so I guarantee you we will not have boats I, anywhere I, in that I, circle. I do apologize. <coughs> I don't know which map we're looking at, but... And so basically, I just wanted to let you know what I've been providing uh, the group and what they've been looking at um, from a technical advisory standpoint. So they have asked information about what polling locations in the November election were uh, highly attended, um, what kind of crossover voting we had. Um, they've asked questions about statute and what the requirements in statute are. Um, and that's why, even though I hadn't um, gone before the group with the primary polling locations for early voting, as I did the court for adoption, um, they understood that the deadlines were here and that the parties had to be in agreement and that there really wasn't time for them to adequately uh, recommend locations for that election. And also the same thing for the May election because those jurisdictions needed to post their orders and notices. So their focus is on November. I've asked them to come back before the court probably in about really the June um, time frame because we will start calling our orders and um, adopting our polling locations in early August. So I want you guys to have time to think about any recommendations that they have. Um, again, Roland expressed that some people are talking about the rural areas and the lack of polling locations out in that area, and that is really because there are none <laughs> out there. And if you, if you look at the heat map here, you'll see that our voter registration population are among those arteries where we have provided polling locations. Um, so for the next uh, meeting, they've requested a map with the commissioner's precincts with the current uh, vote centers there so that they can look at the balance. They're really doing a really good job of trying to get an understanding of all the dynamics that are involved with selecting these polling locations. And they also will be working on a worksheet with some criteria. So as they're out looking, they'll be able to determine if that polling location is adequate for a vote center location. Um, and really, that's, that's, all, that's it. Well, thank you both very much for your time and dedication to uh, include the community in what you're doing. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Mr. Salcedo, for uh, asking for this to be on the agenda and coming and presenting. Will you please open agenda item number 12? 12. Approve and confirm the appointment of James V. Mora as a Reserve Deputy Constable in the Hayes County Constable Precinct 2, effective February 4th, 2020. Commissioner, can I get a motion? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any comments? Will you please call the roll? Commissioner Schell? Yes. Commissioner Inglesby? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Judge Becerra? Yes. No. Will our constable come up and say a few words? Thank, uh, thank you, Commissioner um, Gord and Judge, for having us here. I just want to introduce uh, James Mora. He, um, I think we prepared a, a letter, that, and um, I'll let him introduce himself as well. Good morning, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. I'm James Mora. I just recently retired from Travis County, and I've been a resident in Hayes County for the past 12 years. So now I want to serve the citizens of Hayes County as a reserve deputy. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. So and, if, and if you'll please approach, we'll swear you in right now. Yes, sir.
raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, James Mora, I, James Mora, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, that I will faithfully execute, that I will faithfully execute the duties of office of, the duties of office of Deputy Constable Precinct Two, Deputy Constable Precinct Two, for the County of Hayes, for the County of Hayes, State of Texas, State of Texas, and will to the best of my ability, and will to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and laws, the Constitution and laws of the United States, of the United States, and of this state, and of this state. So help me God. So help me God. baby. And all those interested in being part of the picture, will you please step up? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. How about let's center ourselves, guys, commissioners? Yes, let's get everyone up here for a picture. If you'll come up, she'll take the picture with the chair with you, with your phone. She'll probably do a better job. Hey, Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And yeah, that's a good looking tie, by the way. Thank you very much. Back to blue. Back to blue. <laughs> On three. One, two, three. One more. <clears throat> One, two, three. And one more. Welcome to the rodeo. Open agenda item number 35. Okay, sure. Well. 35. Discussion related to the Hayes County inmate population to include current population <coughs> counts and costs. The Sheriff's Office has provided our office for consistently now, uh, since I've taken office, our report of the jail population. So I thank the Sheriff's Office for that. Hayes County's current maximum jail capacity is 362 inmates. Jail standards recommends holding approximately 10% of capacity open. That lowers our capacity to 311. The jail's daily average was 566 and peak was 574 on January 30th for the week of January 26th through February 1st, 2020. The estimated cost for outsourcing inmates this week is $87,994. The average number of outsourced males is 206 and females are 17. This week's, this week's inmates were housed in the following counties, Bell, Burnett, Caldwell, Fort Bend, Guadalupe, Travis, and Walker. Thank you, Sheriff's Office, for that report. Will you please open agenda item six through 11. Six, approve payments of county invoices. Seven, approve payments of juror checks. Eight, approve the payment of United Healthcare claims. Nine, approve commissioner's court minutes of January 4th, 14th, 2020, January 21st, 2020, and January 28th, 2020. 10, authorize on-site sewage facility permit for a special needs group home located at 13701 Troutwine Road, Dripping Springs, Texas, 78620. 11, authorize payment to Kent Power Sports of Austin related to maintenance and repairs to a 2006 Honda motorcycle in the amount of $647.40 in which no purchase order was issued as required per county purchasing policy. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are there any comments? I just have one on number 11. I'm glad to say that this hopefully will be the last maintenance repair on this motorcycle since we're getting two new ones to replace this one. We'll be All right. Good deal. Well done, Commissioner. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, what's that? I'm sorry. We, don't, we, won't, we won't address it this time. That's not the space for it. 
But I do want to thank Constable Hood for uh, taking the trip from Precinct 4 to come over here and being part of this uh, presentation and, and agenda item. And since there are no other comments for Mr. Hood, please call the roll. Commissioner Inglesby? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Shell? Yes. Judge Becerra? Yes. Please open. Oh, by the way, we were asked to pull number 14. Is there anyone here to speak on 14? Okay. Please open 13, 15, 16, 17. 13. Approve out-of-state travel for the Legal Support Services Coordinator, Emily Sierra, Lead Legal Assistant, Felony, Amanda Calvert, Lead Legal Assistant, Misdemeanor, Nicholas Costilla, and Records Management Officer, Melody Barron, to attend the Tyler Con Connect Conference on April 26th through the 29th, 2020, in Orlando, Florida, utilizing funds budgeted during the FY20 budget process. 15, approve out-of-state travel for Diane Sanchez, Information Technology Department, to attend the Tyler Connect Conference on April 26th through the 29th, 2020, in Orlando, Florida. <coughs> and 16, accept and approve the 2019 Racial Profiling Report and the 2019 Annual Activity Report from Hayes County Constable Office, Precinct Number 4. And we wanted 17. Also. 17, authorize change order number one to the contract between Hayes County and Myers Concrete Construction for the repairs to the Jacobs Well Weir in the additional amount of $1,898.40 and amend the budget accordingly. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are there any comments? Please call the roll. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Shell? Yes. Commissioner Inglesby? <clears throat> yes. Judge Becerra? Yes. Please open 18 through 21. 18. Amend the Justice of the Peace Precinct 1-2 operating budget for $370 additional continuing education expenses related to the Justice of the Peace education seminar held in Austin, Texas on February 16th through the 19th, 2020. 19. Authorize the on-site sewage facility permit for the Blacks venue located at 130 West Concord Circle, Austin, Texas 78737. 20, authorize the county judge to execute an agreement between Hayes County and Plateau Land and Wildlife Management in the amount of $695 for services related to the 2020 Hayes CAD Wildlife application refile. And 21, authorize the purchase of four expandable shelters in the amount of $6,400 as part of the FY20 Department of State Health Services PHEP grant and amend the budget accordingly. So Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Commissioner Smith? Uh, yes, just on number 19 on the OSSF, I'd just like uh, to give Caitlin a minute to speak on that. Um, we've had a number of meetings on this and I've been working diligently. Thank on you, it, Commissioner. So. Uh, Ms. Strickland? Thank you. So the Black Sweating Venue has been going through our standard on site sewage facility review process and they've finally met all of the Hayes County rules and regulations for on site sewage facility. They're well below the 5,000 gallons per day um, requirements that they have to meet statutorily to constitute a septic system issued by Hayes County. They are going to, we're going to make sure that the water usage is monitored for the first year and then implement new processes moving forward due to it being in such a sensitive area. Uh, it's near a lot of floodplain area. Um, it has been Thank you, Caitlin. And I just wanted to reiterate that for the record. So I know that there are citizens that wanted to be here today who were unable to be. And I just wanted to, that stated publicly and uh, let them know that we're still working on it. So thank you. I appreciate it. And that in part was facilitated because of the limited use. Is that right? How they're not going to be on it daily in every single footprint? Uh, was that not part of it? Okay. Well, I don't, I don't believe so. <laughs> okay, very good. Just double check. Yeah. Please call the roll. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Shell? Yes. Commissioner Inglesby? Yes. Judge Becerra? Yes. Please open number 21. 21. Secure. I'm sorry, 22. 22. I'm looking where I last left off. 
22, discussion and possible action authorize the county judge to execute a professional services agreement, PSA, with Binkley and Barfield Engineering to perform detailed design services for the improvements to Windy Hill Road from, from Kyle City Limits to FM 2001. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Borsherding, any comments? Well, just uh, a little background. This is the uh, um, next step in uh, making improvements to Windy Hill. Binkley and Barfield have produced a uh, schematic design, which has been reviewed and approved by uh, my office and the commissioner's office, and uh, will get us into um, final design and ultimately uh, uh, construction. Thank you, sir. Will you please call the roll? Commissioner Shell? Yes. Commissioner Inglesby? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. <coughs> Judge Becerra? Yes. Will you please open 23. 23. Discussion and possible action to consider the acceptance of road construction and drainage improvements. Accept the two year maintenance bond number 050104Y in the amount of $28,303.26 and accept the one year revegetation bond number 064816P in the amount of $14,571.85 for Reunion Ranch Subdivision Phase 3, Section 3. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Borshading, any comments on that one? Uh, no comments. Okay. Please call the roll. Commissioner Inglesby? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Shell? Yes. Judge Becerra? Yes. Will you please open a executive session agenda item number 31? 31. Executive session pursuant to sections 551.071 of the Texas Government Code, consultation with council regarding Lasima Public Improvement District, possible action may follow in open court. And we're going to go into executive session. <laughs>
modifications we are back from executive session and if you will please read that book of agenda item number 24 <laughs> 24 I'm see here. discussion and possible action to consider adoption of a resolution determining the cost of certain public improvements to be financed by the Lacima Improvement District Public Improvement District, approving a preliminary service plan and assessment plan for neighborhood improvement area number two, including proposed neighborhood improvement area number two assessment role, directing the filing of the proposed neighborhood improvement area number two assessment role with the county clerk to make available for public inspection, noticing a public hearing for February 25th, 2020 to consider an order levying assessments on property located within neighborhood improvement area number two of the La Cima Public Improvement District, directing county staff to publish and mail notice of said public hearing and resolving other matters incident and related thereto and providing an effective date. Thank you, Judge. Uh, if uh, Mr. Kennedy would come up, maybe he could explain this to the public. Good point. With this action. Mr. Mr. Kennedy, you're being asked to approach the podium and give us a short summary of this agenda item. <coughs> Hopefully shorter than the agenda item itself. <laughs> so if you could maybe explain to the public exactly what this action is. Are we on item 24 only? 24. 24. Okay. I'm sorry, I was having another conversation. Um, so, so this is a, a, a series of actions that will result in a public hearing be, being held on February 25th, later this month. And uh, that hearing will be held to consider uh, the levying of assessments and an order from the court to levy assessments on property in Lacima subdivision, at least to the extent that it exists now. Uh, when PID bonds were issued um, some time ago, uh, there was obviously contemplated that uh, those bonds would be repaid uh, by way of special assessments on the property or properties that are the Lacima subdivision. At, at first it was property owned by one owner, that being developer, and that remained for some time. And developer, of course, paid uh, the special assessments uh, between the issuance of bonds and, and when the repay period began, and then when lots began to be created and homes began to be built. Uh, now that is transitioning over to homeowners and lot owners, and it's becoming a, a little more complicated, of course, and will become even more so as time goes on. We, uh, we have uh, consultant P3 Works to help us with that part of it. Uh, we have staff dedicated to that part of it as well, and we have it handled. And uh, this is something that you will see uh, that comes back to court on a periodic basis to update uh, who's being assessed, how much, and, and, uh, and how those bonds are going to be repaid. So. That's really what it's about. If you want a higher level explanation, we have Julie Houston, our bond counsel here for, for that. And this, this also means, so this is neighborhood, neighborhood improvement area number two. That means they will 
soon begin or have begun the improvements in that section, then this assessment will be set and then at the time they have completed those improvements is when they are um, allowed to seek reimbursement. That's correct. The, the, um, uh, the neighborhood area improvements are, are being made on a reimbursement basis. The major improvements were made uh, pursuant to the first tranche of bonds that were issued and uh, of course those are rolled into the assessment as well. Hearing be held. Do you, we know that? Uh, here. Uh, let's see. The 25th is a Tuesday. So. Oh, so we'll we'll hold it. Correct. Oh, correct. Okay. We're just uh, this action is providing notice of that public hearing. <coughs> um, yeah, I think you know, we do this oftentimes in in transportation and in subdivisions where we where we call for a public hearing and authorize yes. notice. Okay. Uh, this reads a little differently just because, um, well, because it's PID, it's PID related, so. <laughs> it's yeah. different, okay. okay. I just thought comments, that. commissioners? Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't no. Mm -hmm. Commissioners, any other comments? Yes, sir. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and read this one. I hate to do that to y'all, but I know sometimes they're <laughs> careful about these bond issues. Just, uh, I will make a motion to adopt a resolution determining the cost of certain public improvements to be financed by the Lasima Public Improvement District, approving a preliminary service plan and assessment plan for neighborhood improvement area number two, including proposed neighborhood improvement area number two assessment role, directing the filing of the proposed neighborhood improvement area number two assessment role with the county clerk to make available for public inspection. Notice a public hearing for February 25th, 2020 to consider an order levying assessments on property located within neighborhood improvement area number two of the Lasima Public Improvement District, directing county staff to publish and mail notice of said public hearing and resolving other matters incident related thereto and providing an effective date. We have a motion and a second. Are there any further comments? Please call the roll. Commissioner Schell? Yes. Commissioner Inglesby? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Judge Becetta? Yes. Please open 25. 25. Discussion and possible action to consider approval of a Lasima Public Improvement District Deposit Agreement for proposed future bond test amendment for certain costs associated with neighborhood improvement area number two of the Lasima Public Improvement District. And just to follow format, I'll entertain a motion and so be discussed. Second. We have a motion and a second. Now we'll open for discussion. Mr. Kennedy, can you update uh, the court and the public on what the action proposed before the commissioner's court is regarding this item? Yes, the uh, developer has requested that we uh, engage bondholders, uh, current bondholders, and uh, inquire whether the bondholders would be interested in or would consent to an amendment to the indenture. Indentures, a, a legally binding agreement between uh, the bondholders and those that issued it, and. Um, and we um, would not be able to provide any amendments to the indenture without uh, consent of 51% or more of the bondholders. Uh, that would cost some money, some, some, some time and money uh, to make that inquiry, both with county staff and with consultants and outside counsel for the county. Uh, this agreement here is a deposit agreement that would have developer pay for that time and money that it would take to make that inquiry. And that's what's, what it's about. So if the court approves this item, then uh, the developer will deposit money, which will be drawn on for any work that we perform to satisfy their uh, investigation into whether this changing or amendment to the bond test is acceptable or not with first those that currently hold those bonds and then um, Eventually, if, if they reach that point, then this commissioner's court would then determine whether those bond tests should be or should not be amended. That's right. It would, it would be uh, an action that is some months away if uh, it was an action of this court to amend the indenture to, to make the amendment to the future bonds test, and that's something that would happen sometime later after we've gotten feedback from the bondholders. Okay. Any okay. questions? Any other comments? Hearing none, uh, you made the motion. I think we got and, a motion. Uh, we will please call the roll. Commissioner Inglesby? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Schell? Yes. Judge Becerra? Yes. Let's cut it loose. Open number 29. 
29, discussion and possible action to authorize the county judge to execute a $25,899 proposal from Beckwith Electronic Systems, LLC, for replacement AV video audio equipment for district courtrooms number one, three, four, and allow a discretionary exemption pursuant to Texas Local Government Code 262.024A7D and amend the budget accordingly. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Commissioner? Uh, well, Judge, I think some of this equipment has come to the end of life and it is just uh, not cost prohibited uh, to repair it. And so there has been money identified in the uh, county and district technology. Yes. Yeah. This, um, if I could correct, it should be the county courtrooms one, three, and four. We repaired um, district courtrooms last year. Oh, it should be county court. Yes, it should be county court. That's on the second floor. Ms. Crumley, one question. In looking at the background material, what is the, I mean, okay, I see it. Never mind. I was just, there's a, a lot of what my mother would call hen scratching on the, <laughs> on the proposal, and I, I think I can follow it. So. And all we in building maintenance really do is facilitate the um, scheduling of the, the project. Gotcha. Access. Right on. And I, I want to make a correction. It is cost prohibited. I think I said it was not. It is cost prohibited to, to repair these, so we will replace them. And that it's also county court, not district court. That's correct, correct with that correction. So we have the motion and the second. And uh, if there are no other comments, please call the roll. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Shell? Yes. Commissioner Inglesby? Yes. Judge Becerra? Yes. Please open 26. 26, discussion and possible action authorize on-site sewage facility permit for three short-term rental cabins and grant a variance to section 10 M one B of the Hayes County rules of on-site sewage facilities at 630 Wynn Road, Wimberley, Texas, 78676. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Ms. Strickland, if you don't mind, just quickly explain. This is a variance uh, that is fairly common. I'm assuming I'm correct on that. Um, and I think this has been done in this exact way for either this development or prior development or one very similar. It is a um, variance that has been issued in the past. So they're asking for a variance from flow equalization. They have oversized their system, and the system will be utilized in a primarily residential way with the short-term rental cabins. It's not going to be industrial wastewater. It will be very similar to a residential It was interesting to read that uh, last sentence. If the I dog food? It. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I remember that. Being the one on usage. Agreed to a few times. I was thinking about. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and so in lieu of uh, equalization, uh, we have been allowing for the oversizing. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Any questions from the court? And you think that's okay, Ms. Strickland? That seems to work for the need? Yes. Tom Hope and Eric Vincasco have both looked at this, and it is something that we have approved in the past, and we haven't had any issues with oversizing this facility. Okay. So we uh, this only works for smaller projects. Uh, we don't recommend it for anything. Perfect. And you'll be monitoring. Yes. Perfect. I'll make a motion for approval. Second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Shell? Yes. Commissioner Inglesby? Yes. <clears throat> Judge Becerra? Yes. 28, please. 28. Discussion and possible action to approve the location of office spaces for the indigent defense coordinator and the records management office within the Hayes County Government Center located at 712 South Stagecoach Trail, San Marcos, Texas, 78. Six six six. Commissioner, a motion. So moved. Sorry. Second. We have a motion and a second. Now we're open for comments. Now, Mr. Mao, you're better up. Thank you, Judge. Uh, I just wanted to make sure to explain and take this opportunity to let the public know what's going on with the courthouse related to this item just generally. Uh, specifically, what we're doing here is outside the law library. Small 
office that has been Dave's file digitization project. So our files, which are voluminous and paper and boxes, are currently being housed in a space just out, just inside the county operations office. They're being carried upstairs to this smaller office next to outside the law library where they're being scanned and then of course sent for this project has been going on for quite a while and going to continue to go on for quite a while longer. While this is, has been going on, oops, just turn that on. Sorry. They're yeah. adjusting. Sorry. Okay. While this has been going on, the the county has been growing. The space in the government center has become more and more to a premium. We have a variety of different uh, additional departments or sub departments that have been added since the building was created, such as the veterans court, the um, the magistrate's office. That of course we just appointed today, as well as what is specifically referenced here, the engine defense coordinator. An engine defense coordinator currently has no space behind the courtrooms where all the judges, staff, and the people that support the, the courts directly are located. And so they are looking at this small space outside the law library, library for the engine de defense coordinator. We're going to remove all of the scanning equipment and so forth out of there, uh, put it, uh, Melody Barron, the records management officer, is going to relocate that. And we're going to allow the, that space to be taken over by the indigent defense coordinator. The reason I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about this is because this is just another example of, what's, of some things that have been going on over the courthouse recently, including expansion of staff across the board. We've got the new courts. My office, of course, adds people as time goes on. So does every other department. The staff or the space in the district attorney's office has gotten to be such a premium that we have taken a conference room and had to turn it into an office for four investigators who share a, a table and are using it as their office space that has taken away some of the accessible space for some of the local bar to use for having their attorney conferences and depositions and things like that. What this is going to do is obviously limit the space that the records management officer has to do her work. We're hoping that that as this project continues and the number of paper files diminishes and the number of digital files increases, digital files obviously take up a lot more or a lot less space, and so that's not going to be a problem. But it is foreseeable as we go forwards that space in the government center is going to become more and more valuable. Um, I would ask you commissioners to, as we go forwards, to consider other other ways to perhaps maximize the space in the courthouse to create additional offices, meeting rooms, things like that. We have some spaces that are, I think, underutilized right now, including the conference rooms on the, the far side of the building from my office on the first floor where the elections are, are sometimes held. Those rooms are, are not utilized as much. They, they can be made, made smaller and, and, and replace some of this lost meeting space that is, is now having to be taken over by active employees in the, in the government center. Uh, but as we, as we move forwards, that, that is going to continue to be more and more of an issue as to when we add people like an indigent defense coordinator, if that office has to grow, which it foreseeably could, the office that she's going to be occupying now is going to turn out to be too small at some point. As my office continues to grow, as we continue to add courts as necessary, all the staff that those departments are going to require is going to eventually use up all the available space at the government center. And I realize that's a problem for another day, but this agenda item, I think, brings that to a, to a point where it's worth discussing. I'm not asking for that discussion to happen today, but as we go forward, that's, that's something we need to start thinking about. Thank you, Mr. Mount. I have a question, Judge, um, since you brought it up. Uh, if, if we were, and, and we need to discuss this, of course, but if we were able to um, use one of those conference room on the first floor, uh, for attorneys, would that be amenable, do you believe, to them? I, mean, I, I believe so. The, currently, those rooms can only be reserved by county policy by county officials. A, de a department head has to basically say. Now, the, the uh, conference rooms outside the district attorney's office, which have been used since the building opened for these sorts of depositions and attorney meetings and so forth, 
those have been under the auspice of the district attorney's office. So we have been managing, taking reservations for that and setting those those up. And there there are still several conference rooms available over there. I'm not I'm not trying to suggest that we've taken all of that available space. But the the conference rooms downstairs, um, if those could be made available, it would simply be a, a policy change to allow defense attorneys, civil attorneys to reserve those rooms for purposes of taking depositions or having having meetings, that sort of thing. Could you, so I, I think I heard you say that there are conference rooms adjacent to your office that are still available for their use? That's correct. Yeah, the, there, there, are, there, there were four. Uh, the largest one, which has the outside wall, which has windows in it, the other three are all interior and do not have windows, so the larger one is the the preferable one for most of the attorneys, but that's the one that we had to take in order to maximize that space. There, that was the only one that would fit for employees, which is what I have in there currently. And Mr. Mao, I toured the facility again. I'm always walking it just to pay, play Tetris with what's going on. And I saw your investigators diligently working, and I thought that was a good use of the space, and they were working, utilizing it effectively. And those rooms you're describing outside your office were unused at the moment that I walked past. One of the things that has been brought up to our office quite often is defense attorneys asking for that meeting space and sitting at a bench in the hallway where the general public can hear all conversations doesn't seem right. And so that's why we worked hard with our maintenance department to provide access to the space just before the courtrooms, if you'll recall. Um, and of course, I'm super frugal, and when I saw the price of some of those locks, I said, whoa, pump the brakes. But what we could do, I thought, was switch the doors so that we still have our courtroom security, which we value greatly, and still provide access to those meeting rooms to our uh, defense attorneys. Some of it has been done it seems as though with the tour that I received, it seems as though we have some undone space, uh, unfinished business that uh, we provided as direction. So there's uh, space in the horizon on that front because they've, I guess, <coughs> fallen behind, got a little busy. Not sure the, the reason, but there is that space still coming to the defense attorneys. Right. And that's... I recall those discussions, and I know that that's, that would be valuable to have that. Um, but as an, another kind of item on that, on that list, two of those, or I think one or two of those rooms are actually currently being used on the second floor now by the Veterans Court staff. Yes. As you all know, Judge Zellhart is very passionate about creating a mental health court, which I'm also in support of. That's going to be additional staff. They're going to have to go somewhere. So they may end up in a space like that, or, or who knows where they're going to be put. But as we, as you say, play Tetris with the, the facilities, trying to figure out where everybody can fit in and, and what's the best use of that space, those, just, just like Tetris, that game gets harder and harder as the time goes on. So that's going to be something that I think we all, we need to keep thinking about how we can use the space that we've got. Eventually, I do think that there is, there is some, some gaps in that building where there are potential places that are just unused right now. Uh, just for example, the district attorney's office. Our front lobby is larger than it needs to be. It's, it's, there are never that many people waiting to get into the DA's office to see somebody or to interact with my, with my staff. There's no current way now for us to use that for anything other than lobby space without adding walls and, you know, there's, there's costs associated with that that we have currently not put any resources to. Those are, those are sort of the sorts of things that I think are probably occurring not just in my department, but other departments that we'll need to start looking at. Maybe we could, um, Ms. Crumley, who's here, if we could maybe spend some time and use this as one uh, area of study, this one issue that we're facing with your office and the, the uh, conference room that our, our bar has been using in the past. Maybe we could just take a look at, at some of these spaces that have been mentioned right now and see if we can find some some solution, if we could work with the bar, set up some meetings, go actually take a look at space, investigate the, the, the DA's waiting room of what would that cost to put a wall in there, but maybe try to get ahead of this and see if we can find an interim solution if, if there are, if there are 
places that they need um, that are not available right now, if we can at least find an interim solution for that, whether it's a conference room downstairs, but then also look towards something that's maybe not necessarily long term, but will actually provide at least a few years uh, before something else has to be done. If we could just kind of spend some time doing that and start yeah. start with this one, since it's 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 something that's happening now, and then obviously we probably need to take a look at other spaces after that. But I think there's there's a priority with this and. If there are some intermediate solutions that we could provide, let's see how what that takes to make that happen, work with those various departments, and then also look specifically in the DA space and see what could be done, whether you know the cheapest way and something that might last a few years and something that might last even longer. I'm certainly in support of that. We've had some preliminary discussions with Ms. Crumley's department about what it would take to, you know, shift the floor plan around in a way that would maximize the use of that space. It, and it's it's a lot of that just comes down to cost. That at this point, that's been a, a cost that we haven't we haven't seen the the available resources to to do that. But like I said, at a certain point, it's going to become a there's just not going to be a way to put it off any any longer. But I'm certainly think that interim solutions have to be considered, and then more permanent solutions have to be thought about as well. Thank you, Mr. Mao. Ms. Crumley. Yeah. A couple of things. Um, one, the courtrooms on the second floor, until Thursday, I had no knowledge, prior knowledge of switching of those doors um, from the hallway to the courtroom, um, and neither did uh, my maintenance manager. And then I think some discussions need to be have, had with the judges about that. I'm not sure they're all on board with that. So I'll... Well, maybe that could be part of this. Yeah. Time that we spend here in the next few weeks, maybe we could start with that, get everybody together, see what, what where that is, you know, put that alongside the, the attorney uh, conference room that has now been changed and see how we can provide some solutions for that as well and look at them all holistically and then come up with some, obviously, let's start with the easiest, cheapest way to accommodate and then have some plans uh, moving forward. That's exactly right. And that mm -hmm. holistic approach, and although none of us are all on board with anything, I've learned that here as the county judge, I think we need to reach to facilitate and provide access because this is a space that is of, by, and for the people. And I heard some of the concern was some potential clicking when a door opens, and I understand that's a distraction. I'm sitting here running this meeting and when people are on the side having conversations it's a distraction so i really do understand and appreciate their perspective but i just ask that moving forward that we all exercise a little bit of uh flexibility yeah i was addressing more of the it hadn't been done yet so it hasn't been done yet because one we didn't know okay. and then two it wasn't something that was really agreed on Very and nice. then to commissioner inglesby's um question about using the conference rooms on the first floor, I think that's something that may be a different issue that Mr. Kennedy can address with public use of our government center. So the, um, I, I considered saying this earlier and then just decided not to, but I'm happy to, to uh, reiterate this. We've talked about it before. The government center is a limited public forum. We, we have other places that we've designated as public forum uh, uh, access for the for the general public that you know, one place is the the courthouse here on the square. If there's some governmental function related to that use within the building at the government center, then it has been allowed. We have even allowed other governmental entities to reserve the conference room space. Uh, considering that defense councils have had access to rooms in the government center already, I don't think it's any real change to designate one of the conference rooms downstairs and allow that use. They are officers of the court. They're probably discussing a case that is a Hayes County case anyway, and uh, a case that relates to our governmental functions. So I don't think that's a, a great deviation from what we've done thus far and uh, would be allowable as far as you know, what, what we have allowed inside that building. So. Okay, and I really do uh, think that we uh, ought to bring the, the bar in. I think they need to be a part of the discussion and solution to this, so I think that's thank a good miss. idea. Thank you, Ms. Crumley, and thank you, Commissioner. Uh, do we have a motion? So moved. We did. We do have the motion. We're yeah. ready. Okay, will you please call the roll? 
Commissioner Schell? Yes. Commissioner Inglesby? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Judge Becetta? Yes. Will you please open 27? Thank you for sticking around. 27. Discussion and possible action authorize the county judge <coughs> to execute an interlocal agreement with the National Cooperative Purchasing Alliance to provide cooperative purchasing services for Hayes County. So moved. Second. Thank you. First, this is um, just a request to join uh, the National Cooperative Purchasing Alliance. Um, it is an association that has already performed competitive um, bidding processes, whether through proposals or bids, um, with vendors. And mm -hmm. as the county seeks to um, purchase um, best value, we look to these co-ops to uh, review if there's any vendors that can provide services for the county um, at the already competitively uh, bid price. Sounds like a great opportunity to be efficient. I couldn't argue with that. No. And, and just to previously on the, this is very similar to what we entered to, into for our agreement for the secures contract a couple yes, weeks sir. ago, correct? Yeah. I mean, I just, I think it's giving us absolute, uh, any time we can get additional purchasing power um, unrelated to how small our county is in comparison, I think it's a good thing. So I fully endorse it. Uh, please call the roll. Commissioner Inglesby? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Schell? Yes. Judge Becetta? Yes. 30. 30. Discussion and possible action to modify the approval process for expenditures from countywide funds, including but not limited to expenditures for outside legal services, which was recently moved from countywide to the Office of General Counsel budget. Okay, so I asked for this agenda item, but we want to have a motion, so could I entertain a motion for the conversation? So moved. Second. Motion in the second. Okay, so I entertain this agenda item because when we did our very last motion last week, we had um, added a piece that I feel the word comes to mind inadvertently um, gave or usurped whatever semantics we want to apply to it, the oversight of the county judge's office of outside general counsel. And I know that uh, commissioners, you have a full-time job running your precincts, and it is a full-time job. I get snippets of it. One of the pieces in my office as the county judge is oversight um, of these types of transactions. I, as you see on the agenda, we have um, approval, like here this week, agenda item number six, approved payments of county invoices. So we all have the opportunity to see it in long, spooled, blocked form, but I get the privilege, not having a specific precinct, to look a little more carefully, see the actual invoices sent to my office, and I, I benefit greatly from that um, fiscal oversight, and I, I genuinely appreciate the transparency piece, and I didn't realize and this is my mistake, but I didn't realize that the motion that was handed to you, Commissioner, was leaving, I don't mind sharing oversight. I never realized that that motion was going to take my office out of it. And so my hope with this action is to allow us the oversight that was, I consider, inadvertently um, removed uh, as the last agenda item in our last court. I'm not trying to slow anything down. I'm not trying to uh, disrupt any process. All I'm seeking is the continued ability as the fiscal steward that I am, the budget officer for the county, to continue to see these in that format. That was the only reason for this. Commissioner? Um, I, I, I think I'd like to call on our auditor to, to speak a little bit to this item. If I could pass this out. And while she passes that out, I wanted to say that I made a, a, a short video trying to, in my attempts to communicate to the community of what things are going on because very often people don't get a chance to see what we're doing or show up in court. As Commissioner Smith pointed out, people from Precinct 4 weren't able to be here for an agenda item. So I made a short video describing the things that uh, were my interpretation of the situation. And when we count the ripples of what takes place and the unintended consequences, as I believe this to have been one of the unintended consequences, uh, leaving me out of that uh, 
uh, approval process, uh, the auditor, our county auditor, received some phone calls uh, asking about this communication that I shared with the community. And I just want to double down and clarify that for those of you watching, the auditor's office had nothing to do with this. It is not a jab or any kind of anything negative towards the auditor's office. This was not my intent. My hope is to uh, shed light on the thing that took place and ideally to undo it. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, I was approached as far as um, the expenditure line item, legal expenses that was in the countywide department, and my opinion was asked as to whether these um, specific expenditures, um, who should be approving them, and if they uh, really should be under a general counsel's office. And um, my response is that um, the individual, and this response is similar to any expenditure uh, throughout the county. It's and it's in a response that has been discussed with our external auditors as well because they look for these uh, approvals as well when they perform their audit functions. Uh, the response is that the individual who is overseeing uh, whether the county received these goods and services on a daily basis is who should be approving those invoices. Um, historically, uh, Legal invoices have been in countywide because we didn't have a general counsel office. Um, Commissioner's Court hired general counsel. General counsel signs engagement letters with these attorneys. He is monitoring, overseeing them. So it does make sense that these invoices should be approved by general counsel. General counsel initials these invoices uh, before they were placed in a countywide uh, new world batch for the county judge to approve. Um, so when when we get to the point where we're moving the, the expenditures out of the countywide, didn't seem unreasonable and to place into general counsel because that is who is meeting with these individuals day to day. Um, when that question was asked, we have been aware that countywide has been serving as an administrative county department. Um, on our financial statements, uh, we are required to list our expenditures by function. So we have the administrative function, we have the judicial function, we have the law enforcement function, uh, community and public service, health and human services, general maintenance, highways and streets. So the items that should fall under countywide should be an admin function that really is benefits the entire county as a whole. For example, um, we have um, uh, membership fees and bonds. The membership to TAC, that is an admin function that the entire county benefits from. That should be in the admin function under a countywide department. Um, but then we have other expenditure line items that have morphed into the countywide department that when taken a really good look at it, they probably shouldn't be in countywide. Um, if you look at the list that I gave you, the highlighted items, those items really do not serve that admin function. And we need to report it properly. We need to report it under the function um, that is a service. Um, for example, we have um, cemetery maintenance is a line item under countywide. Well, those invoices, um, the road department, Mr. Tim Van Voorhe signs off on those invoices, and then they get placed in a batch for the county judge to approve. Well. Really, to Mr. Van de Borde is the one who is out on the field ensuring that the uh, cemeteries were mowed. Um, and then, really, the expenditure is not an admin expenditure. It is a maintenance expenditure. And so when all of these questions began to be arisen from my office, I spoke to the external auditors. And you know, historically, we put a lot of things under admin, but we're getting to be the size of a county where some of these transactions are material. Another one that I could consider material is the autopsy and inquest um, expenditure. That is under countywide as well. Well, autopsy and inquest is more of a health and human services function. So we need to report it under health and human services. 
Um, and we spend more than 300000 on those. Let me double check. Um, so, but, but we get the idea, right. Okay. So my, my opinion is that let's correct our functions to begin with. Um, it is, there's no intent to remove anybody from the approval process. As um, the judge note, noted, there is a line item in the agenda every week for approval of payment of county invoices. So we have our departments at the department level, departments that the court has hired or elected officials, and they manage their departments, and they have their department level approvals. And then we have the auditor. The auditor has to audit those uh, invoices to determine whether you know it was reasonable, it, it met all the law, statutes, purchasing procurement, all of that. Then we have uh, the treasurer who reviews that as well. And then we have our final, which is our commissioner's court, which is up here. You get, receive a listing of the invoices that are ready to be approved on t Tuesday. You receive it Friday. Um, all of you have access to the New World system. If there's any question with an invoice, pull it up. Uh, you can inquire it. If you don't have it, you can call me. And if it's, we have some invoices that are not scanned into the system. Medical invoices because of HIPAA aren't scanned. Uh, maybe court documents are not scanned because obviously there could be children related. So we have certain documents that we don't scan. But this court is always, um, those documents are always available to this court. Just call me and we will make those documents available. It's your responsibility to approve those invoices. I mean, you take a vote on it every Tuesday. Um, I, I'm not here with an intent to remove approval from anybody. I just want to correct um, what uh, it could be material. Um, it's our responsibility as a county as a whole to produce accurate uh, financial information reports. Um, we sign off that we are, in fact, producing financial reports that are accurate. I mean, they're audited by our external auditors as well. Um, if you go down and you start looking at all the line items that are listed, um, I, I made a list of what is the current function and you know some that should stay in the judge's office. For example, we have um, those memberships. Also the independent audit, I would like for that to stay with the judge. Yes, I monitor when they're meeting out and they're located over in my office, but I would like for that to stay with the county judge and for him to re review those invoices and approve them through his department at the county-wide department. Um, cause that, and that is an admin function, so admin, admin, it matches. It's where they don't match, where the current function is an admin because it's being paid out of the county judge and where the actual function is something different. That's the important thing, priority, that we need to, you know, through a budget amendment, through some sort of action, move those out and put them in the proper department so that we're reporting them properly. And um, then if you look at the last column, that's the column of who is overseeing it. You know, that's who me as the internal auditor and the external auditors want to see signing off on those invoices. That's who they want to see signing off, either by redirecting that budget to that department or by um, creating, I mean, that would be the best solution, is to redirect that budget into that department. For example, um, the, the we have a, a postage machine that's Pitney Bowes. Um, all the postage flows through there. The lease for that is um, countywide. It's an admin function. Well, the treasurer is the one who monitors that and they maintain that. Well, treasurer is still an admin department, so we could funnel that into that department. Um, those are just such a, that, those are suggestions that came up after this discussion when I was approached as far as where legal expenses should be, and we've been aware that we could improve our financial reporting. And so this, because of this question came up, this is the opportunity to discuss our financial reporting. You know, I, I certainly want to do the best job that I can do and to present financial statements that are as accurate as possible. Um, and we need to all be in accordance. You know, we are being audited by the external auditors. It is not just my office, it's the entire county. And so we all have to sign, you know, I sign a letter saying that I am, um, you know, presenting the information as factual and as complete and as accurate as I can. And I rely on management and not just the court, but on the county clerk, the district clerk, and everyone else who is handling the finances and the revenues within the county and the expenditures as well, um, that they are reporting and that they are proving that the invoices 
uh, that they're submitting for payment that we did receive those goods and services. So, um, you know, this is, uh, this is a collective effort that I'm asking you to, to help me to correct or better improve our financial statements. So in summary, what you're saying, if I can paraphrase, this is not only a potential correction, but there are many more to be had. And so it might be a good idea for us to create a future agenda item to remedy it all at once so we're not cherry picking and instead we could say here might be more indicative because currently as our general counsel can attest to he sees an invoice as a department head he uh, initials its approval and then we say okay our department head says it happened and then we send it on and so efficiencies are all I seek and transparency and all that on that space so if this is just one of what you're describing if it's my interpretation one of the several or handful of items that need to be updated, well, then I think we're calling for a future agenda item. Well, it's the ones on this list because the other items are... Um, are good everywhere else. Yeah, I mean... In so only these... The law enforcement, the sheriff, it's all under law enforcement. But these are countywide. These are all under admin okay. because they were all placed under countywide back whenever these general ledger accounts were created. And so that's why, because we, everybody was discussing countywide, we needed to go through and this is how it should actually be presented in our financial statements. Now the, now the approval, that is a separate process that, you know, we already have these individuals signing off on these invoices, <coughs> like human resources. They sign off on the property insurance from tech. They, Sherry will initial off and then we'll put it into a countywide batch. Well, we can move that to HR because HR is an admin function and it could go under there. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner? I was just gonna ask Marisol, uh, I, I think I heard correct, I think you said in more than one, so the uh, external auditor also, I guess you were in discussion with them, they also took a look at this and they uh, feel that these changes should be made Yes, they, well, the highlighted ones, definitely, um, I, we, we went over them, we went over what the functions were, and yes, they need to be reported in the correct functions. And then, so, that would be the same and for then, legal services? Well, legal is, so then, that, the ones that are highlighted, so if you see the highlighted, legal is an admin function. So, countywide is admin function. So it's not being reported in an incorrect function. There, in my as well, um, recommendation is that whoever is overseeing the expenditure on a daily basis, that is who should be approving those invoices. More or less the department head role. The department head. Right, yes. that makes sense. Okay, but I, you know, and I understand that, and I thank you for that clarification. Um, I also want to say that I do support, though, the judge in that if he wants to review invoices, any of us, right? We can yeah. ask. Anybody. But if he wants to review invoices and if he has questions regarding uh, especially an invoice maybe in legal services, that that information be provided to any of us that ask. Uh, and I, I don't know if that has to be done weekly. Can it be done uh, with the instruction today that your office provide those, th those invoices uh, to whoever seeks to review those? I'm sorry, did you say specific invoices? Or all in, all in, well, all in any, 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 request? any yeah. requested yes, invoices. No, any request. Um, any request that is made of an invoice, if it's not in the system, I, my office will work on providing it to you. Um, if it will help, I can move the check cutoff date to Thursday. And instead of printing checks on Friday, we can print checks on Thursday. And then the list will be available Friday morning as opposed to usually Friday afternoon. And you can have that list um, available for an extra day for you to look at and see if there's any invoice that is not already in the system that we can pull for you. Anything else, Commissioner? Not at this time. Okay. I, I, on your point about invoices, um, and I know you referenced some very specific invoices where you don't necessarily scan those. 
One of the concerns that I have and that I've, I've noted with the Office of the General Counsel actually is that whenever we have these outside legal experts working for us or these outside attorneys, um, work product appears on those invoices. And there are certain cases where if we have someone working on a case or uh, representing the county, we, we have to be very careful in the publishing or the, the public content of those invoices because it could very well produce legal strategy, uh, talk about you know, the individual cases that we're working on, certain aspects of that strategy that we want to move forward in court. That's a real concern for me. Um, and so I, I applaud the, your response about taking certain portions of those out. But again, I also know that we have that opportunity every week that we've entrusted to someone here um, to look at those. And then I know that I've called over and asked for specific invoices from, from y'all's office and those kind of things. And, and I've appreciated y'all being responsive to that. Um, I really appreciate y'all you going through and doing the due diligence to pull up and look at the individual accounts that, that you have concern with. Um, I think that whenever you were, your office was recognized several weeks ago, again, uh, for this, it's, it's proactive things like this that, that got you there, and I would be very supportive in it. Uh, you know, uh, to the judge's point about a future agenda item, if we could look at these, I mean, I've, I've just sat here and looked at this list. I don't see one of them that doesn't make sense on, that are highlighted on here, and those are the ones, you know, for example, uh, the, the, uh, Parks uh, looking at trapping fees for Texas wildlife damage. It makes perfect sense for it to go under that function. Uh, the HHS and autopsies is a great example. I, it makes perfect sense um, to do it. And so if, there, uh, if we want to look at these specific ones at a future date, we can. If we want to look at them today, I would be willing to support something like that. The, uh, the other thing I would say, though, is that, to your point, Judge, you, you mentioned the video that you did. Yes, sir. Um, here is, I'm disappointed. I, I appreciate you bringing this item up today, and I appreciate the way you prefaced it whenever you brought it up. Um, the way that you prefaced that conversation is not how you did it online and not how you did it in video. Uh, today you said, you know, I, I want to talk about this because I believe it was inadvertent. I believe, and that's not what you said. You, you specifically said that, um, you know, everything was uh, a, de a, deliberate, a deliberate takeaway of your authority and your ability here. And I think that, and you, spe you specifically talk about your role, specifically spoke about your role as a budget officer for the county. And... I honestly believe, and, and statutorily, you are the budget officer for the county. You are supposed to present us a budget, and then we have to, we as a court, uh, with your involvement as a voting member of that court, have to decide where these things go. Um, if there are issues with the changes that we make here, that is, that's an op your opportunity as the presiding official for this county to promote changes in those things and to change things any way you want, and then we. As a, as a court can debate those openly, can talk about them, can choose to do them, choose not to do them. Um, and that's what we did through this last process. And I would encourage you to do that. Um, but today, um, that's not how you prefaced it. And so I, uh, I can tell you it, up, it upset me because I knew behind we had a, a, a conversation. Uh, we read the, that motion in exec. We had a conversation about what it meant, about what it did. And there was never an objection. You never raised one objection. When we had, came out here and discussed it, we all had the opportunity, should we have wanted to, to discuss the, the agenda item before we voted on it, um, to have an open debate about it. Any, any of us at any time have the opportunity to have an open debate, and I believe anybody watching would tell you that we probably do, <laughs> sometimes more often than we should. Um, but the fact is, it, it's still past 5-0. And we could have we could have we could have debated it, or you could have brought up those issues at the time because we had talked about uh, the implication. Um, and so I was disappointed. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. I was disappointed that we had that opportunity. It wasn't seized. And this week, you are portraying it in, a, in somewhat of a different manner, and it's upsetting. So. Thank you for those points, and I appreciate it. And I want to help diminish that upsetting that I've created for you. First, I said inadvertently to your benefit, 
because the note was handwritten and it was handed to you. And when we discussed the action and read the item, never was it mentioned that my office would be usurped. So although we discussed what this would do, never, again, how I started this comment, which was, I have no problem sharing. I'm the guy that asks our bailiff to open the blinds. I want to let the sunlight in. I believe our county as a whole does a wonderful job. I think our department heads as a whole do tremendous things. And for the more than a year, you and I have been sitting here as brand new elected officials. I've always encouraged all our department heads and elected officials to at the podium, please tell their story because we are doing so much more than people know. And so unintended consequences, because I didn't believe, I didn't believe you saw the implications of removing my oversight and, and reducing my office to approving memberships and stamps. I believe that you didn't realize that that would happen because that was my take. Had I that assumption, I would have brought it up. And so the idea was, if we are to have these discussions, I feel that I'll make another video every Tuesday after court from now on with a more free interpretation of what took place. But let me tell you, as soon as I got out of this courtroom, I reached out to our auditor's office and I said, hey, this is my assumption. And my assumption was very deliberate and it was after I had a chance to settle that in, I said, are we really leaving me out of it? Am I now removed from this action? Because I believe people are intrinsically good. I speak from the heart, hope it works, because I'm not gonna change the narrative no matter where I'm sitting, no matter what the screen is. But and what so was my, the answer from the auditor when you said And that? so the auditor, um, she said, hey, we're being transparent. And I said, good point. I said, it has nothing to do with you. What I believe is this, in my impression, from the way I see it, in my seat, it looked like an arbitrary decision because it was all by itself. And so I applaud, this is the first time, I'm not a fan of getting things handed to me on the dais as well. I have not had a chance to offer uh, or opportunity to see it. I love to pay attention to the people as they speak. I'll read the material later. And so I love this idea of streamlining, organizing, simplifying, because let me tell you, the more you free me up as a court, the more I'm gonna do for the people because that's my 100% job and that's my 100% bandwidth. I don't have a precinct as you guys do. And so my job, I believe, is to support you in every way I can and care for the citizenry in the other spaces that are countywide. That's why I always delve into criminal justice, modernization, healthcare reform, and all the other pieces that are countywide type stuff because I respect you guys enough to leave your precincts alone, leave them to you to run and manage. And I more think of it as, how can I be of service? How can I help you in any way to do your job and your precinct? Otherwise, I'm gonna focus on this other stuff. So the idea that this is presented, man, I'm all about it. What I don't want is the perception of, because perception is king in very many spaces. I don't want the perception that we're singling items out. I would all day rather a holistic approach to this audit, thank you, and I do apologize, this. Judge, for just getting it for you, but I haven't. And so I am so grateful for the opportunity to see a whole countywide perspective of realignment of things, of all things. Judge, I, I don't disagree with you, but I think the point that I would make is that the automatic, you, you talk about public perception yes. of what's going on. And I think that at times perhaps you don't understand, or, or let me rephrase that completely. Thank you. At times, um, we as elected officials, we have, uh, how can I put this? We have a direct impact, our actions every day have a direct impact on our citizen. And the reasoning behind those and those kind of things, it's very easy for us to know why we make decisions and why the personal reasons that we make a, a specific vote, whether it be on a, a sewage facility or whether it be on something like this. It's important, those individual aspects are the number one thing and the most important thing in the world to somebody who's a constituent to us. Again, whether it's a sewage system in their home or whether it's what we're talking about today. And we have to keep a level head and look at how public perception is going to be done 
for these things, and we have to look at them all in a level-headed manner. Um, I can tell you that you're being very reasonable when you look at this today, I think. I, I appreciate that. Having that same level of reasonableness and having those discussions with the auditor prior that, that we could have had prior to this today, or you could have had, I think, before you do those videos, I, I encourage you to do all the videos you want. I, I, I don't discourage that at all or, or do whatever you want, but we also have to understand that having the facts and, and knowing some of the background on things like this, um, it just makes for these conversations to be much more civil and much more engaging and much more productive. <laughs> Yes. And that's what I'm. That's what I'm looking for. I just. I don't think those other things are. They don't add to the productiveness or the civilness or, or us getting our work done as, as a court. And and you may disagree with me on that. Um, but again, the things that we're talking about today, I don't really think they're all that controversial. I don't think anybody's trying to assert anyone. I think every one of us. It's pursuant to us to do the job that we're talking about. Um, and, and so I don't. I wouldn't take it personal. I wouldn't look at it that way at all. I just, and you, you understand what I'm saying. I I'm not going to beat a dead horse, but for sure. But that, that's my concern. And the only thing I would have to respond to on everything you said, I don't have a problem with anything you said except having the facts. What I spoke were, uh, from my vantage point, the facts. My office no longer has oversight. As an easy example, there is a sitting elected official in our county today that I will never mention the name. I have that responsibility and I have that um, track record of sharing your concern about releasing information that is sensitive but as the elected official that I am and the regard that I hold for this court in our government I would never leak anything out. That's just not right. Nevertheless, had I not had that teensy weensy bit of oversight that's left out of my office before it's well since last Tuesday now it's gone I would have never known that a sitting elected official out of our county is currently being um, sued however good however bad however anything it is I feel because I am not and I say this often and I'll keep saying it because it is exactly what it is I am left out of the loop on many conversations for whatever reason that I feel that this was an opportunity for me to put my nose under the tent and see what's going on since I'm not actively um, not paid yet. Be paid. sought after for feedback until it comes to court. And so my only hope is for, for continuity, for inclusion, for a predictable process and a predictable flow. That's why I have no problem with all these things. But when the moment comes, because I feel that I owe that to the citizenry, when the moment comes that I feel that something isn't going as it should, I'm going to speak up about it. And it's a tough thing, and I know you feel the toughness, and I know that you guys understand how tough it is. And so it is not lacking in facts. It is just the way I saw it, and it is still true. We no longer have oversight. That's, that's, that's a ridiculous comment. I mean, I just cannot take that anymore. And we have an auditor that is independent of this body for very good reason. That if I'm if I'm if I was someone paying attention to this conversation, I don't even think I'd know what we were talking about right now. So maybe to I'm gonna since everybody spent so long talking about this, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time. I have some experience with this. <clears throat> you present a budget as a budget officer that's in statute with our population right now. It will no longer be in a year from now. You present a budget. The court considers that budget. We eventually adopt a budget. No expenditure can be made that is not budgeted. That's the first. That's the first check. So we all have equal oversight as to whether funds are budgeted for certain types of expenditures. And our auditor's office makes sure that they believe that a budget, that a ex potential expenditure is budgeted. That's the first check and balance. If that's not the case, nobody can spend the money anyway. It has to first be budgeted, which is approved by the court. Then the way we spend money, it depends on how much money we're spending and what type of service it is. Uh, if it involves a contract, the contract would have to come through court has to be agreed upon equally. It's, we all share that responsibility to, to approve that contract. If it's an expenditure of a, you know, a box of paper towels, uh, you know, it, it has to follow our purchasing requirements and state law. Whatever the case is, when that item or service is procured, our auditor's office has oversight in that. We, that is their job. They make sure 
that one, we have approved the expenditure of the funds through the budget process and that the expenditure has been procured properly regardless of what that type of procurement is. Then when it is purchased, when someone actually purchases it, they, they submit a purchase order, they, 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 they finalize the contract and the services are performed, the person that oversees that, that understands what those are supposed to be, is the one that, that manages that. If uh, courtroom repairs are going to be made, our um, maintenance department oversees those repairs. They make sure that they are done according to the contract that we have entered into with that contractor. And that department head is the one that says, okay, the work has been done. And then that invoice is submitted to the county. And our auditor's office, before they do anything, makes sure that there is a contract or some document that authorized that work to be done. And then they submit that for approval to the person that has the, the most knowledge, the department or elected official has the most knowledge about whether that work was done properly. And that's what we're discussing right now, is that step of the process. For instance, if this courtroom is repaired, that invoice is approved by the department head that was overseeing that project. That invoice does not come up in a batch for any court member to approve. It's approved by the department that's responsible for it because how would I know when the contractor showed up, what they did, how many hours they worked, you know, how would I know what, <clears throat> how many hours an attorney worked on something? I'm not the one managing them. I'm not the one checking to make sure they're doing what, what they have agreed to do and what we have agreed to allow them to do. And so that's what we're discussing right now is that point. There is, that it does not, that has nothing to do with oversight, does nothing to do with usurping anything. Um, in, in my opinion, it, you have created this perception that somehow there is a removal of oversight or we are usurping something that is completely ridiculous. And the, the list that the auditor has given us makes a lot of sense to me because I was in the office at one time, for instance, when uh, autopsies and inquests came up for approval, I always asked the question, why am I approving this? Why is this in the county judge's office? I, how would I know? I didn't perform, I, I wasn't, it, I, it never came through here. What, what am I doing now if it's just, the ability for me to see what it is, you always have that ability. We've always had that ability. We are equally responsible for that oversight because we approve those invoices and we have the ability to ask questions um, at any given part of the process. If, if you're in here and there's a contractor working and you, not, you don't, do not believe that they are doing what they are supposed to be doing or what you thought you agreed to in court, then you go to the department and you said, hey, what's happening? What? I thought we agreed that, this, that they were going to have this done by this date. What's, what's up with this contract? We all have equal oversight throughout the entire process. That's our responsibility. But to characterize th that there is somehow usurping authority and make people think that there has been some measure removed or some uh, level of, of auditing removed from the process is, is completely ridiculous because it's not the case. And our auditor is here, and she does not work for us. And there's a good reason why she doesn't work for us. Her job is to make sure that all of those rules are followed, and her office does a really good job of it. I think this cleans a lot of things up and does put the responsibility on the actual party that should have the responsibility. The one that actually clicks the approve button should be the one that has the most knowledge about whether that work was performed based upon a purchase order, based upon a contract, because if not, they need to say, hey, hold on a second. We're not, we shouldn't pay these people yet. They're, either, they're not done. They didn't fulfill... Uh, the contract. And, to, and again, that all ends up back here. There, there is no, again, this, I can't imagine someone trying to understand what we are talking about. I don't even think they would know because they're assuming that somehow there is some oversight being removed, which, which I think is, is, like I said several times, I think it's ridiculous. Yeah, you've said that several times. And the, the point that has changed that, although you may find ridiculous, is that my office no longer sees the actual invoices. You have the ability to see the invoice We all have the ability want. to go right. check on potholes and precinct four as well. Nevertheless, we don't always do it that way. And so there has been a change, and I just wanted to make sure that you both realize that although you may not be as sensitive as I am to it, there has been a change, and that's what I will continue to highlight, and there has been an invoice with a letterhead 
from an organization that has provided work for the county that I will no longer see, that I will now see in a long stream of things. That sure, I could, I could you ask. You could see it if you, you want. Just ask I could ask. <laughs> like I don't I see this. But now that piece is missing. And if you guys don't see that as a difference, I'm fine. We don't have to well, argue we're just further. arguing whether it's different or not. Absolutely it's different. That, I mean, that's, okay. that's that, of course that's it's different. Point. It's different for a reason, though. Mm -hmm. I think that... I there's, think a reason, that there's a reason behind why the auditor is bringing us, this to us. It's to ensure the proper approval of things. That's what this is all about. How are you to know whether a legal service was provided? That's why I asked the question. But you are the one that clicks the button. The one that clicks the button should be the person that is more or less saying, I agree, I am held accountable that I oversaw this work being done. And to give it to somebody that didn't, I think, is, is, is not uh, financially sound. Because it should be the person that is held accountable with overseeing that should be the one that makes the approval. It, that's just a technicality. I think... If, if we authorize our general counsel to hire an attorney, he should be following up with what they do. He should know how many hours they worked. When they submit an invoice, he's going to look at it and go, you know, well, you know, I, I talked to you on the phone, but it wasn't for, you know, two hours. It was for 30 minutes that day. Why, do, you know, why is there a charge for this? That's the individual that should be, be approving it. It doesn't mean we all have oversight. We continue to have oversight. Hold on one second. Did you want to add anything, Commissioner? Uh, no, not at this time. Go ahead. Judge, I, I, I guess the one thing that I think the, the reason that, that it, it's bothersome to me is that we, as, as court members, every week when we get that invoice batch, I, go, I sit down and I go through every one of them. And there are times whenever I look at something and I go, you know, I, I want some additional background on that. I do want, but it's, a, it's part of my due diligence as an elected official that I feel like I need to do that because that's one of the jobs that we are assigned. And it's not one of the fun jobs. It's not one of the things that, you know, I don't necessarily look forward during public comment every week to hearing about brake pads for the 800th time. But whenever I, if I do have a question about brake pads, I've taken the time on Friday to look at it and say, okay, well, I know we spent $875 on brake pads for the sheriff this week, or that we are, are going to vote to do that. Um, but if I have questions, I feel like it's part of my duty as an elected official who has oversight over that to ask about them, to call and say, hey, can you tell me about this line item? Can you explain it to me through the auditor's office? And if, they, if, if I don't call the auditor's office about it, more generally, I call that department head and say, okay, um, Caitlin, if we are, you know, we've got these five expenses for, uh, you know, sewage services, can you tell me about this? I, I'm just using that as a made-up example, but, but I do that. And I think that it's pursuant to us to do that. Um, when was the last one you asked for, just as an example? Uh, I've got how many just individual, I'm going to, let's look at the agenda today. How many individual... Uh, I thought you might remember off the top of your head. I don't want to belabor this. Well, no, further. today, for example, I, I talked directly to uh, Jerry Borschling about one of our, uh, one of our bonds, and I, the bond, the bond acceptance. And so I looked at it and said, okay. That was an invoice line item? Well, it was, a, it was an issue, well, It's today, not the same example, though, but okay. that's okay. But that's invoice, all right, don't worry about it. Invoice I it. today, I, I actually it. talked about it. A $30 oil change for a motorcycle. I went directly to that department head. I said, and I even referenced it in court today, if you'll remember, thankfully this is the last time we're going to have maintenance on this specific motorcycle, correct? Because it will no longer be in the fleet and we'll move on. That was something that was important to me. And me too, yes. That was a visible from the agenda item so, level. Yes. There's a perfect example of it. And agenda I would encourage you to do the same thing. Oh, I do. I do. But that's fine. It's uh, no problem. Will you please open agenda can item? I, can I, I, I got one more thing to say is whatever I do not necessarily care beyond what I've explained of who, where this, who has this oversight, who has access to it. If there's a way, I think we all have access to the system that we can drill down into invoices if we want. Whatever the case is, I believe whatever our auditor believes is the best way is the way that we should do it. If the county judge approves everybody's invoice because of that, then I don't care if that is the best way to do it. But I'm going to leave it up to the professionals. They can make a decision, recommend that to the court. This list looks reasonable to me. Again, I don't think it's usurping anybody's authorities. I think that's a ridiculous comment. It's for political purposes. We all know what it's about. We can quit sitting here wasting our time talking about it. Whatever the auditor believes is what we should be doing. So we can back off on that for political purposes. I'm not running for anything. And all I want to tell you is I'll highlight the last time 
that my office was seeing physical invoices and I no longer see them after the last motion and that was the purpose of my comment and I will n not veer from that point. That's and I true. want to- Do you to believe that our auditors yeah. should have some input on what the best way to- And I so want right. to, give me one more second, and I want to adopt all the things that the professionals are suggesting, but I want to have a chance to look at it. And so I'm all about it. I'm all about that very message you said of mainstreaming and listening to the professionals and following the roadmap. I have no problem with that. It's just important to me that we don't cherry pick things that have an interpretation potential. Yes, ma'am. I would just like to make it clear that you do have access to any invoice you request. Of um, no one is take away, taking away any access. Um, the approvals is, the recommendation is being made that they be placed under the department that oversees them. That is the recommendation made by the auditor, the, the extra auditor, and that if there, you ever have any uh, problems of t accessing any documents in our system, please let me know. Yes. But no one is removing your access to these documents. Right. You made that clear. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, did you we, have an additional well, comment? Well, we, we do have a motion and a second, and I'm not sure that we want to take any action today or if we want to just come back. I, I, I'm asking. I, I think that was a motion to discuss. It was. Uh, and and it's, it's not discussed. a specific action, uh, but the, obviously the court can propose another action if it wants. Uh, let, let me respond to a couple of things, if you don't mind, uh, before we close the item. Uh, I think it's been... It's been construed that there was some sort of last minute uh, uh, slip to Commissioner Smith motion by myself. And I just want to point out that when we come out of executive session, about 90% of the time, there's a handwritten motion in my handwriting because normally while the court's discussing something in exec, uh, as I can by the time I write down what I, I think is a prospective motion, it is still always the motion of the court member that takes the motion. It is not mine. Uh, I do not own it. I do not want to, to own it. But I'm usually trying to capture the discussion. We did discuss both items uh, or both parts of that motion that Commissioner Smith made that passed 5-0. And there is a, an, an, an effort to make a more efficient system, not to usurp authority, but to make a more efficient system for payment. We have to live with the Prompt Payment Act. Uh, it's codified. If we go past 30 days on an invoice, uh, technically we owe interest on that invoice. And uh, the invoices that were in question in this particular instance were invoiced in October. And that one was paid in January. And uh, the other one was uh, invoiced in November and has not been paid yet. So that is not prompt and it is not in compliance with the Prompt Payment Act, that is the effort, is to make it more efficient. And um, I welcome you all to ask for invoices anytime you want to see them. Thank you, Mr. Any other comments? We can. I, I would just like to say, given this list, um, I would love um, for the auditor's office to come, come back with a, an agenda item in the near future, not at some point in the future, but in the near future, specific to these accounts that you've referenced. Um, it'll give us some individual time to look at it per the judge's request, but I would, looking at the, the highlighted accounts here, um, if there's not, if there's not a, a uh, you know, if there's not a, a court action today, I would love to push forward with these because, again, all of them make pretty good sense to me. <laughs> yes, again, like I had mentioned, the priority is the highlighted items because we need to report proper financial statements and those functions, those expenses need to be recorded under a different function. Uh, fiscal year 2020 is where we're currently at, so we would need to um, ask that the court amend the budget and move those expenditures to the proper department with the proper function. And that is something that I will be asking the court to do, um, especially with the highlighted items because um, when one is made aware that there's a, a expenditure that should be more appropriately classified, I, I need to address that. And, and that was the purpose behind this, is let's go through this and address everything. If we're looking at one line item, let's address them all. 
Thank you. That's the last part that I was hoping for. When you're looking at one item, let's address them all. Thank you. So can we go on to the next items? You guys are ready? No roll. No, we don't need it. Please open 32 and 33 in executive session. 32 executive session pursuant to sections 551.071 and 551.074 of the Texas Government Code consultation with counsel and deliberation regarding all individual positions in the Hayes County Office of Emergency Services. Possible discussion and or action may follow in open court. 33 executive session pursuant to sections 551.071 and 551.074 of the Texas Government Code. Consultation with county and deliberation regarding employment and duties of all individual positions that report directly to the commissioner's court. Possible action may follow in open court. Judge, uh, just for pro proper procedure, do we need to withdraw the motion on number 30? There was a motion and a second. Do we need to withdraw it since we didn't take any action? We just vote on it. Never. Yeah. I think that's just to open the discussion. We just, okay. I just wanted anything. to make sure. Thank you, ma'am. And so we're going to go into executive session.
so that's why we gotta give them a, okay, we're gonna We're back from executive session, and I just want to thank my colleagues for the wonderful conversation we've had. In executive session, we interviewed our final candidate for emergency services director. Now we have a decision to make. We have some very qualified candidates that apply, and so now we're going to churn through that very important position. And we also talked about other components in our county operation. And so I just want to share my appreciation for what we've done and we've accomplished. And unfortunately, that's the only time and place we can do it. So. With all that, I'll entertain a motion unless there's other comments. Move to adjourn. Second.